I'd like to say that today is June what? Today's tooth. 20, 23rd. Today's 23rd. June 23rd, 2010, and we're at the home of Louis Omar? Omar? Osmar. Osmar. O S M E R. And uh, Diana Bender, and these are the people that uh, found the. Uh, Diana found the inscription. The inscriptions at Silver City, New Mexico. So, what year? 1967. So some observations, so you have some comfort here. The inscription is situated on a patented mining claim with mineral and surface. It is, in other words, on in free simple. We own it outright. Oh, you Lots have the stock pack. and huh? barrel, cool. kit and caboodle. It's ours. Cool. The taxes are relatively current. Cool. We were drilling in that area with a big old heavy 16 ton Ingersoll Rand T3 drill rig seeking mineral. With authorization. And the children were running hither and thither and round about. Diana comes into the drill rig and she says, Daddy, there's some writings up there you should see. So we finished the borehole we were excavating, drilling, penetrating. Folded down the hydraulic mast, picked up the leveling rams, and secured the drill rig, and blundered up the slope and observed the inscriptions. In my view, there are two or three points that need illumination in lay terms in the English language. Number one, many, many, many years ago, my dear friend, now deceased, Calvin Sailors and I, ran that country many times hunting rabbits, trapping skunk, and so on. During the boom times at Chloride Flat, which was a silver discovery, and I think has to be part of the record, we observed every little click mark in the limestone where a shod hoof of a dray animal had struck, or where a rimmed iron wheel had marked the limestone. Those marks were bright and white, That was a good 40 years ago, maybe more. It was somebody figured out in 1937. We were teenagers, 13 year old. The point being that abrasive or contusive markings on limestone endure. They don't go away anytime soon. The weathering rate of limestone when it's exposed is very, very slow. Hmm. It's not an inch a century. It's not an inch in a thousand years. It's not an inch in ten thousand years. The markings endure. 
my point is they can be very old and still be quite legible. Now whoever did that inscription had a delicate touch, tools that could be sharpened and resharpened and sharpened again, probably use a a maul with a handle and an extension, maybe cottonwood or some not extremely hard wood to strike the little delicate implements with. Now if you want to look into metallurgy you'll find that the Chinese could use spring pole drilling and rope lines and steel bits and drill a water well extremely deep, sometimes two or three thousand feet. Unbelievable. Now the point there is the metallurgy. You know you can get a book called De Re Metallica. I've read that and I got that book. Good for you. It's unbelievable what they did back then. Well, the pumps and no, everything. That's not yeah. very far back comparative. That's 1540. These writings probably go well beyond that. Age-wise. I don't really know. I, I was here but I wasn't out there. <laughs> Toledo steel was famous because it was durable. There was a reason. They didn't know why, but there was tungsten with the iron ore that the famous Toledo blades were made from. Now, if these writings are all over the West, it would seem to me, and I want to explain why, that your tools would wear. Mm -hmm, you're right. So you might want points. You go ahead and get that. Inserts. Interchangeable portions. During more modern times, we have learned about high carbon steel and how to temper it. You know, the miners from Cornwall, they drilled by hand. I have drilled by hand. I am a winner of the first place with hand drilling. Huh. So I know about tempering yeah. steel. Excuse me, do you call that single jacking? When you do That's you know, true, single jacking? and in fact, there's a book called Single Jack and Hand Steel. I think an author is named Young, I'm not sure, don't even care. But anyway, the point with this portion of this discussion is that if these writings are more or less widespread, the user of the tools had to have a means of sharpening, replacing, replenishing the points, whatever. Couldn't have been done, you know, with a soft implement, and it couldn't have been done without a delicate touch. The, the margins are very discreet. The writings are very distinct. Some of them 
are depicted other places. I'm sure you people know what an ank is. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> there's an ank out there. I'm not totally sure what that may mean. At one time we had a local lady down at Deming, 50 miles south here, named Carlson. She wrote a book about treasure markings. One of her symbols is the ank. Another symbol out there looking down into the valley very obviously is depicted an eye and so on and I believe the author or writer's logo is down and over to the left. Have you seen the inscription? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few years ago I met Calvin. Sailors. Yeah, about five years ago I came through and okay, looked at him. Well, he was, we were actual blood brothers, Calvin, and we cut our, I still have the scar. <laughs> That's the way the Indians did it, so we did it. Anyway, he was real straight true blue guy and we haven't been overly protective but we haven't you know shouted from the rooftops about this depiction I am told this and I'm not an expert if you go to some petroglyphs Let's say they're Anasazi, and you inscribe with chalk so that it can be photographed more clearly. The chalk has a chemical reaction with the stone, and it's harmful to the inscriptions. Mm -hmm. That's what I hear. Now, way back, I was exposed to a little writing called pale ink. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. No. That's mm -hmm. about the Chinese? No, I'm not. It's pale funny. ink. Okay. Did he say yes? Yeah. He said yes. Some think it was written 4,000 years ago. It is almost a certainty that some of the Chinese emperors burned every book they could find. If that's true, we're fortunate if pale ink is authentic. And I believe it is. And with this, this may apply. Students attempted to put the writings down in Asia. They couldn't make the writings fit anywhere. So some wag decided to try it in this continent and it just fit exactly. Here's a salt lake. Here's a mountain measured the height of the distance, the whole thing fit precisely in North America. That being the case, if it's acceptable, pretty hard to refute that the writings were done here in this country. What does that do? Can't certify the period, the year, the date, but it may mean absolutely or positively that we had visitors here a long time ago with the capability of measuring and keeping records. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any pale ink booklet. Huh. 
So, why or who or what would conduct these writings? Was it to show that they were here? Was it to show some local conditions? I can't answer that. I can't read it. I've tried this and that and the other. I want to tell another story. Maybe or maybe not related. For a long time ago, a prospector came through this neck of the woods. And he visited a ranching operation off to the southwest. And he had some mineral specimens with him. And he asked the cowboys, have any of you ever seen anything like this? And there was a Hispanic cowboy, pretty apt observer, and he said, well, there's a lot of that stuff over on Mud Flats. Well, show me. So the cowboy showed the prospector a lot of that stuff over at Mud Flats, which is now chloride flat. And there were, and this is authentic, huge, huge chunks of silver chloride on the surface. Black as coal, as you know, we used to take pictures with silver. Silver is light sensitive. That was the beginning of Silver City. That's why Silver City is here. The silver discovery at what is now known as Chloride Flat. Whether there was a relationship between the mineral and the writings or not, I can't say. It might have been, or might not have been. It might be of interest to tabulate or make note of mineral situations in the vicinity of some of the other writings. That's how the question for me, I'm you know, nearing the sunset of my life, which I can live with just fine. But you youngsters <laughs> might want to, you know, consider whether or not there's a relationship between Western mineral occurrences and the writings. There may be, there may not be. I have no idea, but it's probably a worthwhile consideration. Now I want to tell you a story completely to one side that you won't understand for a minute, but pretty soon you will. One time I was at sea on a military vessel, a troop ship. Making way, that means the ship was moving. And we heard this strange sound. And we felt our vessel give way, and heave to, and turn slightly. And when you do that, there's a calm momentarily near the vessel. There was a cockle shell about 20 feet long, odd shape in my view, about 10 feet wide, no mast, with a single upright diesel engine, and that's what was making the noise one occupant. So the skipper had an interpreter ask this occupant, this man, 
if he needed food or water. And the occupant signaled no. Do you need fuel? No. So the skipper rang reverse one third. He backed gently away from this little cockle shell vessel. Turned to the port, bypassed him gently so the wake wouldn't disturb the little vessel, and we went on our way. This occupant was aged. He was gray, he had a little beard. He was 900 nautical miles from Japan. And that's where he was headed. Hmm. My point is this. If you have a seacoast, you're likely to be a seafaring people. You're going to see a floating log out there and climb up on it and realize it floats. You're going to build a boat. Pretty soon you're going to build a ship. Pretty soon you're going to recognize the wind, and that's how you would get here. You might want landfall most of the way. I would. Leif Erikson did, you know. He mm -hmm. named Greenland, Greenland. And he named Vinland, Vinland, because there were vines. He saw grapes growing. You know, we know that the Vikings sailed up all the European rivers to raid. There's a depiction in Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, in the floor of one of the mosques, in tile, depicting a Viking vessel with the shields and sails. The horse's head in front, and the inscription there is written in runic. Now we come over here, and there are rune stones in Arkansas. <laughs> How could they possibly get there? There are rune stones in Minnesota. So on the point being, the seafaring can be achieved without question. Therefore, it's not argumentative that we could have had visitors many, many, many centuries ago, possibly accounting for the strange writing. I, I don't really know. I'm not qualified to say, but I can do a lot of guesswork. Mm -hmm. So, tools, the delicacy of the tools, the ability of the tools to withstand abrading from being struck. The touch was absolutely delicate. It wasn't violent. It was gentle. That's why I said there may be a cottonwood mall instead of a hardwood mall. A little more gentle, a little softer wood. I don't know. That's up to you experts, but... You know, you bring up a great point that I've never even thought of, and that is of the tools, how they had to resharpen them, and I never even thought about that, but you're 100% right. Well... You know, and you being a miner and that, you'd know that better than me, and right. I never even thought of that point, and you're 100% right. That, that's part of the overall consideration now. When do you think that, when do you think that kind of metallurgy existed around here? Well, let's think about the Egyptians, for example. 
we know that they use draft animals in their hieroglyphics. We know that they had the wheel. We know that they had the plow. They shielded their plow points with iron. That's 7,000 years ago. Now, Native Africans would gather iron ore and build a little simple furnace and in theory Metallica you can see the same thing. And they had a reed stuck in it here and one over here and a person sitting there going And they were using charcoal and iron ore and they would make a bloom in that very primitive furnace. And then they would pound and pound and pound the resulting mass called wrought iron. Now they didn't, in my view and knowledge, understand alloying. We use chromium and vanadium and molybdenum and other alloying metals to make steel, including manganese. As it comes to pass, many iron deposits have manganese associated. Therefore, if you make a bloom and you beat on it till it's wrought iron, you might have some sort of Manganese steel, when it's alloyed, it's no longer iron. It is then steel. Now, we're going to jump sideways a little bit. Tool making techniques. Several things, and when you get tired of this, just say so. Nope, you keep going, I'm interested. Are you thirsty, either of you, any of you? I'm, I'm fine. fine. How are you guys? We're all right. We have running water here. <laughs> Somebody runs for it? I almost lost my point, but not quite. We're making tools. Yes. In the old days, the Etruscans knew how to make a file. And they knew how to make a saw. And they knew how to make a gimlet. Also, you can make a hole in wood with a hot iron. My mother taught me that when I was six years old. She said, honey, stick the poker in the fire and then put it on that board. And I did. It went right through the board. Neither here nor there, but we're on tool making. So to make a file, you had to have annealed metal. Because you had to take a sharp point that you could continue to sharpen and scribe across the billet that was going to become a file. Once you got it scribed, you would slope your implement and make serrations. You had a file shape. Then it had to be tempered. I have no idea when tempering was discovered 
But I'm satisfied that the Chinese knew how to temper two, three, four thousand years ago. They had a neighbor, Japan. The samurai ran Japan. The samurai had a sword that long. Two-handed, curved heavy, quarter of an inch thick, and sharp as a razor. And the samurai swords were superior alloy. And they go back a long ways. The samurai swords were high quality alloy metal not plain old wrought iron, which is very soft, very easy to work with. You can forge it literally in a wood fire and with a couple of rocks, if you wish. So, tool making has to be part of the study. Quality tool making must involve observation. Now I'm going to direct us aside again. The Greeks had oracles, and the Romans had oracles, and they found that the waters that these oracles were beneficial to man. I'm harping about observation. Time passes. Marie Curie comes along. And we have radiation discovered. Every oracle is radioactive. But these dozen other springs are not. Therefore, long observation allowed the determination that those waters were beneficial to man. And what I'm talking about is observation. Now we're switching back to steel making and tool making observation of material from that hill there gives us durable implements. And the material from that hill and that one and that one don't measure up to what that one does. So metallurgical studies may be indicated because as going back and being a little repetitive, if you're going to go around pecking on these rocks with delicate instruments, they just about have to be good ones of high quality, resharpenable. Now you can do that by abrading. That's not particularly difficult. But the composition is a point of interest. How do you achieve proper instrumentation that will endure? That is a point worth some overview. Probably Obama. So, his written stories. now we have a combination of effects potentially applicable. I have wild input here. Here's an example. In the state of Idaho, for example, as I said, there are 107 mining districts. When the great 
move to the west began, the prospectors managed to walk on every ten feet square of the whole United States. They developed a great outpouring of metals and minerals, primarily gold and silver driven, of course. So, correlation between mineral occurrences and the writings might be worthwhile. It might be that proper tabulation would give some sort of indication. I don't really know, but the second thing, of course, would be to investigate as far back as is possible to go tool making. Now, we just demonstrated that the Vikings were at Istanbul. And I'm satisfied they were in the Mississippi River and the St. Lawrence Seaway and so on. Therefore, it is conceivable in my view that different techniques around the ancient world could be passed along, passed down, probably sometimes closely guarded secrets. I hate to mention this, but one of the means of tempering, for example, is to take a red-hot sword and run it through a slave. I think that's a fairly crude tempering technique, personally. Fairly hard on slaves, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, we learned from Marco Polo that there was a civilization in the East. Curious if all of the prospectors crawling all over the country left any notice of the inscriptions. We haven't ever found any, have we? Well, any <coughs> older discovery? I have had the pleasure of <coughs> over my lifetime, I'm 85, prospecting in Montana, Oregon, Wyoming, California, Nevada, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. And I was gifted with acute eyesight for many years. During all my travels and all my exposures and all my interviews with other prospectors and miners, big and little, large and small, I have never encountered any sort of inscription comparable to this. Now, I have encountered others. I'll give you an example. Once upon a time, here in Silver City, everybody burned coal and wood to cook with and heat with. There wasn't a tree within a mile and a half of Silver City. Then the natural gas came along. And you could turn on the valve and you didn't have to put out this pall of smoke over the city, town. Saved a lot of trees. The trees are coming back. We had a woodcutter, I have a point here. His name was Carver. 
and he would actually build road by drilling and blasting over rough places that were impassable so that he could get his wood truck to more wooded areas. <coughs> Out in <coughs> Silverdale Canyon, west of here 20 miles, there's a rock about four and a half feet long, two and a half feet wide, and two feet high, and has his name chiseled on it, Burt Carver, 1937. There is a woodcutter putting his name and date on a rock. Now west of Highway 90, which goes to Lordsburg, is what's known as the Burrow Peaks. On the way up high, and it's very obvious, you can see a rock outcrop. You can see it four, five, six miles away. My initials are there. They're shaped like a diamond. Not quite joining at the ends with an O in the center. Years ago, some of the ranchers' kids found this inscription up there, mine, and they were sure it was a treasure sign. <laughs> One of my friends knew what that symbol was, and he broke their hearts. And no, that's not a treasure <laughs> sign. That's Lou Osmer's initials up there. But Diana, I think. It's a well-taken point. It's fairly obvious that these inscriptions are not stuck out in ordinary plain view. It appears to me that they may be, you know, established at positions that are somewhat well, protected. You aren't going to run over it with a wagon, that's for sure. Goats won't graze on it. There's no verdure. There's no appealing wood source. There's no mineral up there. There's no particular threat, in my view, to the persistence of the depictions. I believe the sites were carefully and deliberately chosen so that they would be more or less protected and have a chance to endure. Now, I don't know what background the inscribers might have had. It's doubtful that they were interested in mineral production, but they may have been interested in observation because, as we qualified, for example, pale ink is a very accurate narration of where this salt lake is, where this mountain is, and so on. That tells us that deliberate selection was probably practiced. <coughs> the, the, the means of survival, let's touch on that briefly. When the Spaniards came up here, they would drive hundreds of head of livestock, cattle, sheep, goats, swine, droves of poultry, 
seeds. They had to survive 1,500 miles from points of supply. So it might be a, an interesting point to make note of whether or not <coughs> there's nearby livestock feed. Here's an example. Let's say you're a military officer. Let's say you're a West Pointer and you're cavalry and you have a troop you're responsible for. Well, you had necessities. Water, grass, and wood. Did these people use Livestock for transport? I have no idea, but an indication might be this is good pasturage here, and here's a writing. This is good pasturage here, and here's a writing. There's a spring, here's a spring. Those comparisons should probably be tabulated. That's a good might idea represent a clue. Right, that's a good idea. Now how they personally survived is the next question. Were they hunters? I could shed a little light on that. And I wish to. You knew Calvin Sailors. He and my brother were arrowhead fanatics. Out west of Highway 90, six miles, there's a side road turns to the left. They were out there prospecting and looking for arrowheads. My brother picked up 37 arrowheads in one little area. He was gifted with the most remarkable eyesight I've ever been exposed to. We all granted that. Calvin picked up 17 himself. Obviously a battle point. And there were some steel arrowheads. So that dated the incident. It was a wood party, it's well known. Their tombstone was over at Fort Cummins for years and years and years, and they moved the graves away from there. So what I'm saying is that there may be clues. I have no earthly idea what they might be to how they survive now and tell you something different. Once upon a time my brother and I, the name was David, we were up in a saddle west of here 25 miles. Park, in our Jeep, no top. And we prospected for hours and hours. Came back to the Jeep. Time to leave. About 3, 3.15 in the afternoon. We get in the Jeep. Here's a driver and an occupant. We don't want a punctured tire, so I'm looking back here. And he's backing up and curving slightly. Hold it! Hold it! There were two pots side by side the coil type of pottery, not painted. They were that high. They were shaped like this. This being the bottom, this being the opening. And they were resting in big pieces of broken pottery. And they were buried. Only the very top part was exposed. We dug them out carefully. I don't know what became of them. I think my mother sold them. <laughs> and inside, pure 
carbon, totally black, <coughs> were little kernels of the seeds of grandma grass. Obviously, both of these vessels had been filled with grandma grass strippings and buried for who knows what, emergency, I don't know. I'm going to rave on. My dear son and I, his name is Iggy, International Geophysical Year being his year of birth, and we're traversing a rugged mountain range, and I mean rugged. And lo and behold, here are seven <coughs> nested cooking rocks, all stood on edge, each one with a slight concavity, well concealed in the rocks. What? Yeah, they're rhyolite. They're still there. We didn't touch them. We didn't disturb them. They are there. I'm up at Santa Fe and there's a beautiful Navajo lady. Honestly, he was hefty, but he had blue eyes. Now I know that's crazy, but this was at the museum. Her husband was there with her. And he had billets of straight grain, sod, juniper wood, not cedar. And his duty was making kindling. Little long pieces about the diameter of an ordinary lead pencil to feed her fire with. She had a gruel mixed up of blue corn. And she dipped her hand in that batter across this cooking rock, just like the ones we found, and lift it up that quick with the other hand because it would cook that quickly, and put it in a stack. So I'm telling you, there were means of survival not ordinarily considered by us.